say good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is a great pleasure to introduce Professor Nancy D. Tommaso today. Um, Nancy is Vice Dean for Faculty and Research and Professor of Management and Global Business at Rutgers Business School, Newark and New Brunswick. Prior to taking up this post, she also served as Chair of the Department of Management and Global Business for 12 years and as doctoral director for the PhD in management program. Combining her sociological training originating at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with that of business administration from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, her research specialties include the management of diversity and change, the management of knowledge-based organizations, and the management of scientists and engineers. And that always makes me smile. I kind of wish you, wish you good luck on that one. <laughs> um, she's been elected to several national offices in various professional associations, including a position on the American Sociological Association Council as chair of the organizations and occupation section of the ASA and president of the Society for the Advancement of Socioeconomics. Nancy has written and co-authored several books and has published numerous articles in journals of note addressing all aspects of interpersonal and structural issues relating to diversity in the workplace. Previous work has involved the analysis of 100 innovation teams, which was funded by the National Science Foundation, analysis of the career experiences of 3,200 scientists and engineers from 25 major organizations, as well as research on organizational transformation and leadership, addressing issues such as the changes in the structure of organizations, work, and careers, and the management skills needed for the coming decades. Her most recent book, published by the Russell, Russell Sage Foundation and to which she will be speaking today, The American Non-Dilemma, Racial Inequality Without Racism, is in many ways a culmination, at least momentarily, <laughs> of her long-standing scholarly career. Interdisciplinary and empirically grounded in people's everyday lives, her book offers a thorough and comprehensive analysis that has yielded a conceptually challenging contribution to understandings of racism and racial inequality, advantage, disadvantage, and discrimination, and one that has proven contentious across both academic and public spheres. So without further ado, Nancy D. Tomasso. I want to say how pleased I am to have the opportunity to be here and to talk to you and I see you're all on this side so I may uh, spend more time over there um, and I am especially delighted to be able to talk about this work because I've heard a lot about the kinds of things that some of you are doing and uh, hopefully there's some continuity there um, let me say that what I am hoping to do is really to talk about three different things. So depending on how much time it takes to get through each of them, we may shift things around a bit. But I first wanted to talk about the, um, the initial argument in my book around the issue of how people get jobs, uh, specifically focusing on issues of advantage, social capital, social networks. Uh, again, U.S. focused. Um, then I would like to talk about how that particular dynamic uh, that I discovered in the interviewing that I did with people in the U.S. Um, helps us understand post-civil rights politics in the U.S. And I had some sense that some of you may be interested in recent uh, U.S. political dynamics and the sort of strange nature of those, and I think that some of what I'm doing might have some uh, insight to offer about trying to understand post-civil rights politics in the U.S., which also may have some relevance for Europe as well. And then finally, uh, assuming that we have time, then I want to talk a bit about the overall picture of how race and immigration and uh, various intergroup dynamics affect um, uh, the sort of changing structure of political 
uh, influence and how that may have some relationship to your interest in immigration and so on here. So that's the three things that I'd like to do and um, hopefully we'll get through all of it, but if not, you at least have a sense of what I was trying to do. So I titled this, uh, my book is called The American Non-Dilemma, Racial Inequality Without Racism. But I titled this Race and Politics in the U.S., The American Non-Dilemma. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what that allusion is to, uh, the concept of the American Non-Dilemma is a reference, reference to the very famous book that was written by Gunnar Myrdal in 1944 in the United States. Uh, Myrdal was a Swedish social democrat, a Swedish economist, who was invited to the United States by the Carnegie Foundation to essentially write the definitive work on racial issues in the United States. Uh, he wrote this during the 1930s into the 1940s, and of course you know that time frame is the World War II was just getting started as he was writing this book. And he was doing a lot of the research in the 1930s. Um, he had lots and lots of money from the Carnegie Foundation to do this work and uh, was able to hire something like 70 research assistants, of some of the best known people who became famous in sociology, and ended up with a manuscript of about 1,500 pages. And his basic argument in this book, which he called The American Dilemma, was that the United States would solve its racial problems because of the growing understanding of the incompatibility or contradiction between what he called the American creed, liberty, equality, justice, and fair opportunity as themes in the American political system, and the existence of racial inequality. So Myrtle had this notion that because of the growing tension between that incompatibility, whites, particularly in the North, in the US, would join social movements and uh, use the courts and the political system essentially um, to change what was going on in the American South and solve the racial problem. My book is called The American Non-Dilemma, and one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is to explain why there hasn't been a moral dilemma about the existence of racial inequality among whites in the U.S. And my argument is that in the post-civil rights period, particularly, racial inequality has gotten reproduced primarily through the advantage that whites give to other whites more so than through racism and discrimination of whites toward non-whites. Um, and that that kind of advantage, the reason that whites give help and advantage to other whites, is because it is linked to how people get jobs, particularly that are protected from market competition. Uh, so in order to get a, a job that has good benefits and pays a living wage, a decent salary, you have to get jobs that are protected from market competition. Unionized jobs, public jobs, jobs that aren't being having the wages driven down by a lot of people having access to them. And whites pass those jobs along to each other, um, and that reproduces racial inequality. I further argue that using advantage instead of discrimination in the post-civil rights period contributes to the legitimacy of ongoing long-term racial inequality. Uh, because if people believed that it was discrimination and racism that in fact was causing continued racial problems, it might create the moral dilemma that Myrtle was concerned about. But because people are not having to engage actively in discrimination in order to benefit from the existence of racial inequality, it contributes to long-term uh, justification or legitimacy for the existing uh, inequalities that exist. And I would further argue, although this has certainly been a point of contention, that advantage is probably more important than the dynamics of disadvantage in the post-civil rights period for reproducing racial inequality in the United States. 
So my argument is supported by research that I've done uh, over the last number of years. It is a study based on semi-structured interviews with uh, 246 white people between the ages of 25 and 55 from three parts of the United States. I did interviews in New Jersey, which is on the east coast of the United States. I did interviews in Ohio, which is in the Midwest. And I did interviews in Tennessee, which is in the South. Uh, New Jersey is a very cosmopolitan, diverse population. So I wanted to do interviews with whites where there were a lot of non-whites around. Ohio has racial diversity, but in the areas where I did interviews, it's predominantly white. Um, and then Tennessee is predominantly white, but it's also in the South, so it has that kind of racial history. Um, the research methodology that I used was modeled after what Michelle Lamont, who's currently at Harvard University, has used in several work, works that she has done, uh, one called The Dignity of Working Men, and which the people that I talked to were randomly selected from, uh, from addresses using what are called crisscross phone directories, where we identified household addresses, sent people letters, called them on the phone, asked if they fit the demographic profile that I was looking for, and then those that agreed to, I interviewed, and I did all of these interviews myself. So it did take a very long time. All the interviews were taped, transcribed, encoded, and I used qualitative software to do the analysis. Uh, which it took a very long time to do. Uh, all the interviews were about two hours, but they ranged from one and a half to four hours, so people had a lot to say. Okay, so this is my basic argument about the jobs part of my book. So let me just walk you through the three major arguments that uh, I have, and then um, I'll talk about some of the details of it. So in general, whites in the United States don't think much about racial issues. They don't think it has much to do with them, and they never think much about it. But if they are confronted with the existence of racial inequality and asked to explain it, they generally would say it's because there are prejudiced people or racist people out there. Those racists cause racial inequality, but they think that though that's not them. They are not racist because they're committed to colorblindness. They said race doesn't matter, color doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if you're orange or black or purple or green, uh, all that matters is what you do as a person. But in making this kind of presentation of self, that they're colorblind, they're not racist, it's just those racist people somehow over there that are causing the problems, they never <coughs> think about the fact that they live in segregated neighborhoods, go to segregated schools, attend segregated churches, and in many cases work in segregated workplaces. And that in that kind of segregated life, they have the opportunity to pass along opportunities or advantages to people who are just like them, namely other whites. Then in addition to talking about racist people, those races, uh, again, if whites are asked to explain racial inequality, they'll say it's because those races discriminate against people. They actively exclude them or keep them away from opportunities. But they themselves don't do that because they believe in equal opportunity. If you say, you know, what is the standard of fairness? They'll say everyone deserves the same chance. Everyone should have an equal opportunity no matter what. But they never think about the fact that they in fact live their lives in search of intentionally seeking out and actively using unequal opportunities in which they seek advantages to get an inside edge for jobs that pay a living wage whenever they can. Um, and then finally, if you ask whites why is there racial inequality, why do whites have more than blacks, they'll think it's primarily because of individual merit, because the people who have more deserve more, uh, however, if blacks have less, it's because they haven't made an effort, because they don't take responsibility, and because many people told me because they don't have hope. They just don't know how to get out of those circumstances. Their parents didn't teach them that. But they think of themselves 
but I worked hard. Uh, I put forth the effort. I'm very talented and so on, but they never think about the fact that that talent they have was fostered by and they had the opportunity to use it because of the group-based nature of the advantages that they could tap into. And then I would argue that all of social science for the most part, because I read a lot of it before I started this project, and most of the, uh, the public media <coughs> representations of racial inequality focus so much on issues of racism and discrimination, putting it in that negative framework that it's because whites do bad things to black people or other non-whites. That's why we have racial inequality. That I argue that focusing so much on racism or racists and discriminators essentially provides the legitimacy to whites who help other whites uh, without having to have hostile feelings or having to discriminate against blacks. And because they don't have to do these negative things, they actually feel good about themselves instead of bad about themselves. And that contributes to not having a moral dilemma about racial inequality and, in fact, to legitimizing the ongoing um, structure of group relationships in which whites are advantaged. Um, any questions about that before I take the next step here to give you some of the details? Okay. So, here's the profile. And I started thinking about these issues, by the way, because in the mid-1980s, in a business school as a sociologist, uh, I began teaching courses on diversity in the labor force. Most of the people that I taught in my classes were white men in their mid-20s. They were already in the workforce. And I thought what I was going to do in these courses is bring sociology to all of these uh, people and tell them about inequality of income and education and jobs and job segregation and so on. And when I talked about those issues, essentially I would get kind of a blank stare because no one seemed to understand or think that there was a problem because everybody was very nice. Everybody was concerned about their family, their children, their neighborhood. Everybody told me they did a great job at work. Um, they thought about themselves as having worked hard, sacrificed, persisted. And they also thought that um, that uh, they also thought that racial inequality wasn't a problem for them because they all believed in civil rights, right? None of them discriminated, they said, right? I don't discriminate, I believe in civil rights, everybody should have the same opportunities. So when I would talk about all these issues of inequality, they wouldn't understand why there was a problem. Uh, it wasn't about them, again, it was about those races. So I began to try and think about, well, how do we end up reproducing racial inequality when there are no races? Because my students all said they weren't the races, it was somebody else. Um, so I began to look at how they tapped into advantages through their social resources in their families and neighborhoods and um, thought that in doing so that this was a fair thing to do because everybody else could do it the way I did, they said. Okay, so essentially what I found was that whites believe that racism is the cause of racial inequality, but they believe that those are other people who are the racists, not them. They believe that a commitment to equal opportunity is the solution to racial inequality. That's the policy that should be uh, supported in order to get rid of racial inequality but they live lives of unequal opportunity, or what Charles Tilley called opportunity hoarding, <coughs> and that people get what they deserve because of their individual effort, but they're not conscious of the group-based nature of the advantage that gives them uh, opportunities over time. Okay, so in the United States, uh, whites live in segregated neighborhoods, in schools, workplaces, etc. They tap into unequal opportunity actively, intentionally, and purposefully over their lifetimes. And as I'm going to show you in a minute, I found in the interviews that I did by getting individual job histories that 
of the jobs that people got over their lifetimes, they got some kind of inside help from people. And that was true of 99% of the people that I interviewed. And that this help is group-based, not just I have a friend, uh, but it's a white friend because I live in a white neighborhood and I'm white and so on. Um, okay, so whites use racial advantage, but they do it without knowing it, recognizing it, or acknowledging it. Um, they give an emphasis to colorblindness, uh, which supposedly we ignore differences because they don't matter, and that allows them to avoid this moral dilemma that Myrtle had talked so much about. But using this advantage again, which is a positive way to react, uh, to act toward other people as opposed to a negative way to act toward other people, is what maintains the legitimacy of the system. So, another underlying theme of this research, because I was looking at how people get jobs, is recognizing that using these kinds of advantages, getting a friend to help you or a family member or someone in the neighborhood or someone you go to church with to tell you about a job or help you get in to uh, set you apart from other kinds of applicants is really the only way to have a decent life in the United States because if you don't get that kind of job essentially you're in poverty and so there's a very strong motivation to use this kind of help, and it's tied very much to the structure of the labor market. So getting an inside edge, uh, limiting the supply of other people who might be trained for that kind of position, taking wages out of competition, which is what unions do, uh, this is how people end up in decent lives in the United States. And again, if they didn't do that, they typically uh, aren't able to support themselves or their families. So social capital is the route to good jobs. Good jobs meaning jobs that have benefits and pay a family wage. And I essentially define that in three ways, uh, drawing on the work of Paul Adler, who's at the uh, University of Southern California. Um, I defined it in terms of getting information that other people don't have such as someone telling you about a job, this company is hiring, you should go check there. Uh, having someone use influence in your behalf, such as someone say, this is my friend, take care of them. Uh, or someone who actually could hire you for a job or give you an opportunity. Help that people got, again, through the interviews that I did, primarily it's from family members, from friends, from acquaintances, or someone who takes a liking to you but those who take a liking to you will typically be people like you. Whites who live in the same neighborhoods, go to the same churches, and so on. Um, sometimes people actively seek out this kind of help, and other times it just happens, as um, Bourdieu says, because of the segregated patterns of everyday life. People happen to be together, and then when they know of a job opportunity, they tell the people who are near them uh, about that. Okay, so this is my basic data from the jobs part of the study. Um, in this chart, again, I did interviews in New Jersey, <coughs> Ohio, and Tennessee. So this chart is looking at the structure of opportunity by state. And the numbers across the bottom here are the first job, the second job, third job, etc., up to the tenth job that people held. And since I did individual job histories, with people between the ages of 25 and 55 um, when I did the interviews. These are not people all in the same age range, right? So this could be some people had 10 jobs, other people didn't. Uh, so the numbers of jobs in each of these one, two, three, et cetera, changes. But this is the percent of the first job, second job, et cetera, where people got information, influence, or opportunity in the stories they told me. And again, what you see is it starts out very high uh, and continues at about the same, is essentially almost every job across people's lives, they got some kind of help like that. And it didn't differ by state. 
It also didn't differ by middle class or working class. And again, this starts out high, somewhere around 60%, and then it goes up to an average of around 70%. Okay, so 60% of the job, first jobs people had, somebody helped them get it. 70% of the jobs over their lifetimes, somebody helped them get those jobs. There is a difference by gender. The average for men's jobs was 76%. The average for women's jobs was 60%. So for both of them, it's very high. But there's a gap there. Why? Because women's jobs are less likely to pay a family wage. So for women who are working in retail or waitresses and what restaurants and so on, you don't need to use social capital to get those kinds of jobs because as one of my interviewees said, one job is as bad as another. But when the job matters, when it does make a difference in terms of what kind of job you have, people use their friends or family members to help them get those jobs. Um, okay, so this pattern Again, what Charles Tilley calls opportunity hoarding, keeping opportunities for people you know who are like you, is essentially affirmative action for whites, which they never think about. So most of the jobs that people got was for, through friends, families, and acquaintances, and the only exception is that 30% of the jobs where people didn't use help. Again, it was sometimes because it wasn't such a good job. Um, sometimes. Uh, when there were, uh, as a tight labor market, like during the Vietnam War, people could get jobs just because anybody who was breathing could get a job. Uh, sometimes a few of the people I talked to, particularly engineers, got jobs through college placement offices. But in general, 70% of the jobs people got were through this kind of help. There are also a couple examples of people who had help uh, or people who tried to help them, but they weren't competent enough to use the help. So that didn't lead to a job for them. Okay. So when my interviewees talk about issues of inequality and what's fair in life, they tend to, and, and they're basically all against affirmative action, they think about affirmative action as cutting in line by minorities or women sort of not waiting their turn and trying to get in line, which isn't fair, and yet what they do is save a place in line for their friends. And they don't think about those as the same thing. So women and minorities are cutting in line, they're simply saving a place in line for their friends. Uh, so the structural explanations for inequality, uh, and particularly for white privilege, is invisible to them. Uh, whereas individual explanations, I worked hard, I tried, I was motivated, I got an education, is what comes to mind for them. So when they think about inequality, they understand that um, nobody makes it without their own effort, but they don't understand that nobody makes it on their own. Right. So both of these things are taking place in their experiences, but they're only conscious of the one part of that. Um, and to some extent, e e when, again, when I talk to people in the interviews, if they did think about the fact that somebody helped them, they tend to reconstruct that experience as they were motivated because they used that help. Right? So that demonstrated how, how much effort they had made. Um, as opposed to they got that help and somebody else didn't. Okay, so whites, in my experience in the US, use structural advantage to help themselves. The fact that whites are disproportionately in jobs with authority, higher income, more training, in better neighborhoods, better schools, etc. So they use that structural advantage for themselves, but they don't want the government to provide structural help for minorities or white women. Uh, whites think that they got ahead because they merited it, because they worked hard, and as they told me several times, so blacks could have just as much as I do if they would just do it the way I did. But when they say that, they mean work hard, they don't mean have friends who can help them. Right? 
Um, so I'm not going to get through the political part of this. Okay, so the consequences of racial inequality without racism, again, the ability to uh, benefit from racial privilege without having to be racist, is that racism is not about whites. They don't think about that in themselves in those terms. Uh, the responsibility for racial inequality falls on blacks themselves. So whites actually see themselves as part of the solution instead of part of the problem. They, we're good people. We believe in civil rights. We don't discriminate. It's just those racists, and that's not me. So there isn't a <coughs> dynamic or a motivation for them to get politically involved to solve the racial problem because they don't think that they have anything to do with that. Uh, as um, Jennifer Hochschild said, for whites, they simply don't understand what the fuss is about when you talk about racial inequality. So again, my argument is that inequality without racism contributes to the legitimacy of reproducing long-term inequality. Those racists, those other people, are seen as the source of the problem, but most whites see themselves as blameless. Equal opportunity is seen as the policy solution for, equal opportunity, for uh, racial inequality but whites actually use unequal opportunity throughout their lives. And the group-based nature of inequality is masked by their emphasis on individual achievement and effort. Okay, so I talked to 246 white people um, between the ages of 25 and 55. Essentially, almost everybody I talked to, 99%, got jobs the way I just described to you. <clears throat> but when I ask people about issues of inequality and fairness and public policy issues and affirmative action and so on, people didn't talk about those things in the same way. There were differences in terms of the political views that the people that I talked to held. So I was trying to understand why these differences. And uh, that's why in my book, in the second part of it, I try to put this uh, argument and the picture of how people get jobs into an understanding of post-civil rights politics. Because essentially, um, in the United States, with two major political parties, Democrats and Republicans, in order for either party to win an election, they are essentially competing for putting together a coalition of voters. And because whites are still by far the majority, they are particularly competing for different groups of white voters. So in the people that I talked to, I divided them up into groups based on how they talked about issues of politics and uh, fairness and inequality and so on and realized after I did this that the, the people that I talked to represent these different segments of the white electorate that the Democratic and Republican parties are always competing for. And that their views of politics, whether conservative or liberal, I would argue, um, essentially reflect how the civil rights movement affected their ability to hoard opportunities for people like them and how they thought that public policy about civil rights affected those, uh, their ability to do those things. So these are the groups that I divided my sample into. And the ones that are in yellow are the ones that are the big groups that, again, the Democratic and Republican Party basically compete over. Uh, a group that I called working class racist in quotation marks, which basically white working class, uh, religious conservatives, which in the U.S. means Protestant religious conservatives, a group that I called the apolitical majority, which in the U.S. are the independents. They don't care about politics. They don't have an affiliation. And then a group that I called the rich white liberals, which are professionals uh, and so on. And then there were some other smaller groups uh, that were in my sample that didn't quite fit that dynamic but um, they were there. So again, the white working class, 
Protestant religious conservatives, independents, and professionals are the big groups that are always uh, targets for political elections, particularly at the presidential level, and these were all represented in my study. Um, Protestant religious conservatives used to be Democrats in the U.S., but now they have become the heart of the Republican Party. Uh, I would argue because racial politics became religious politics. It was a way to mobilize that particular group of people. Uh, the white working class had previously been Democrats, but they've increasingly become either aligned with the Republican <coughs> Party or they haven't voted. Uh, and that shift occurred as the Democratic Party more openly supported civil rights for blacks. The white working class began to be less affiliated with the Democratic Party. Independents are primarily former Republicans uh, who have become an increasingly important swing vote and they have disaffiliated with the Republican Party but not really gotten to the point where they affiliate with the Democratic Party but primarily in by having a negative reaction to the influence of religious conservatives and the right-wing populism that has become evident in the Republican Party. And then professionals by class should probably be Republicans, but because they also have reacted against uh, the influence of religious conservatives and right-wing um, populism, they become more Democrats uh, in the United States. So here's important things to keep in mind when you think about how race affects politics in the United States. Each political party is trying to put together a coalition of voters. Republican Party used to be primarily rural and suburban white voters, and they had dominated U.S. politics from after the Civil War up until the, the mid-1930s. Then the Democratic Party under Roosevelt put together what was called the New Deal Coalition, which was big city machines, Chicago, New York, um, LA, Baltimore, Philadelphia, uh, unions, white ethnics, particularly Irish and Italians, religious minorities, particularly Catholics and Jews, poor people, racial minorities, and intellectuals, and they dominated US politics from the mid-1930s until the Civil Rights Movement. And then since the mid-1960s, and then especially since Reagan's election in 1980 80 and 84, uh, there's been a toss-up because Democrats in the South, be, white Democrats in the South became white Republicans in the South. And that led to essentially parity in the Electoral College between the Democratic and Republican Party. And uh, that parity means that every election is up for grabs. And that's why there's such hostility and lack of cooperation in the United States between the Democratic and Republican Party because everybody is trying to put together a winning coalition in which the margins are very close and uh, they're particularly doing this around uh, segments of the white population. So in trying to put together that coalition, every party tries to peel off groups from the other side. Uh, they tried to attract members from the other parties' coalitions, such as the Republicans trying to get the white working class to vote for them, like the Reagan Democrats. They're trying to keep the other party's members from voting. So right now there's this huge issue in the United States about voter ID, trying to make sure in key election states that people who would be likely to vote Democrat can't vote, like immigrants, students, or minority. Uh, black people, uh, and so on, um, and or they will mount, in some cases, a third party candidates that will cut into the vote of the other side. That was done quite a bit in the last uh, 40 years, um, not so much recently, but it's always a threat. And then this is an important dynamic to keep in mind, that throughout U.S. history, um, either party that tried to give too much attention in terms of electoral politics <coughs> to blacks or to minorities or to immigrants is always at the risk of losing more white votes than they will gain from minorities. So that happened to the Republicans around uh, Reconstruction, at which point they essentially gave up black vote to uh, the Democratic Party and to uh, Jim Crow system, 
and it's been a real problem for the Democratic Party since the Civil Rights Movement. If the Democrats focus too much on minority issues, they lose the white working class vote. And if they give too much attention to the white working class vote and focus <coughs> on issues like unions and jobs and job protections, minorities will stay home and not vote. So it's a continual tension in these parties. And so in the post-civil rights period, both the Democratic and Republican parties have been in this intense competition for the white vote, uh, especially after the Democratic South became the Republican South. So here's the geography of US politics. And uh, I might make through most of this. The Democrats essentially control the coast. They control the northeast coast, um, and the west coastal states. And that's where a lot of professionals, highly educated people are, not entirely, but they're disproportionately in those areas. Republicans in the United States control southern states, which, by the way, is the largest electoral region in the U.S., which I didn't understand uh, until I did the study. And they control the Mountain West, Montana and Idaho and so on. And that is that whole area is very, uh, has a strong influence for religious conservatives. So when it comes to electoral politics in the United States, particularly around presidential elections, almost all of the action is in the Midwest, and the issue there is about trying to win the work, white working class vote. And so you can understand some of the peculiarities of US politics by knowing that that's really what's going on. Um, so, again, I, I would argue that racial politics became religious politics, uh, in part because after the civil rights movement, everybody believed in civil rights, so you couldn't be explicitly racist and get the vote, but you could talk about moral issues and God, guns, and gays, and you can mobilize the same group of people. Um, the anti-intellectualism and the right-wing populism that has become very prominent within the Republican Party. And you can think about Ronald Reagan and his sort of regular guy presentation of self, George Bush and his kind of mal malapropisms <coughs> and ability to speak, and Chris Christie, the current governor of New Jersey. He is a viable candidate because it's all about the white working class vote in the Midwest. Nobody cares about whether he is attractive to religious conservatives and whether he's too moderate on abortion. The only issues that matter is can he mobilize the vote in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, uh, because that will win the presidency for the Republican Party. And that's also why in those states, they all have, quote, moderate Republican governors that once they got elected, started trying to make sure Democrats can't vote. Uh, in those states. Um, so, uh, as I said several times, as I was talking to people and trying to understand these politics, I still think that race has a great deal to do with it. Um, but again, nobody is against civil rights, but they talk about the same kinds of issues in other ways. It's all about morality and about uh, American values and so on. So I included in my interviews uh, a little survey that included some questions from the national election studies uh, that measured concepts like racial resentment, whether people think the government has gone too far to assure equal rights, and so on. So I won't go through the details of this, but basically this shows you that in my groups, this is middle class conservatives, working class racists, religious conservatives, and the apolitical majority. They are all substantially more racially resentful on the measures that I included compared to rich white liberals. And they're also more inegalitarian. Uh, and even when you control for the other things, it also shows that they're still more racially resentful. Interestingly, individualism doesn't differentiate the groups because everybody in the United States is an individualist, so that's not what matters. But what does matter is racial politics underlying a lot of the kinds of things that people talk to me about. 
Uh, so I won't go th say anything more about the details of that, but it's sort of a confirmation of the argument I was making. So if you think about U.S. politics, um, <clears throat> I'm drawing here from work that was done by Earl and Merle Black, who are two uh, political scientists, um, and plus some other things. This is essentially what the political story is in the United States around presidential politics. The Republican Party has to get 60% of the white vote. They need to get a majority of the male vote, and more the better. They need to break even with females. They're never going to really win big with females, but they need to get close to 50%. And they need to appeal to Christian conservatives and to working class races, those white working class people. And they need to emphasize race, but in the guise of morality. So they can't talk explicitly about race, but they can have all kinds of implicit discussions about race that mobilize people to vote Republican because of the fear somehow that those people are going to take our resources or our jobs. And then independents who used to be Republican need to be brought into the Republican coalition. Um, for the Democrats to win, they need to get 40% of the white vote. Better would be good, but at least 40% of the white vote. They need to get 45% of the male vote, and they need to get a majority of the female vote, and more would be better. They also need to get 90% of the black vote, and they need black voters to go out and vote, which they don't always do. They need to get about 60% of the Hispanic vote and the Asian vote, and they need to get the working class to vote Democratic instead of shifting over to Republican or to stay home. They need to get the secular vote and the liberal vote. And they need to emphasize class issues to mobilize the white working class and not give too much explicit attention to racial issues. Um, they need to increase the turnout and head off any third parties. And if they could get these independents to come over to their side, or to stay home, then that's how they won the presidential election. So let me go uh, I thought I had a slide in here. But let's see where I have it. To explain what's been happening. I mean, I can say it, but let me see if I have it here on, the, on my slides. Well, I don't, so let me just do it. So essentially, since 1964, when Johnson won in a landslide, the Democratic <coughs> Party has almost never gotten 40% of the white vote. Obama had 43%. That's how he won. Uh, he had 43% of the white vote and 53% of the election, of the electoral vote. But in most cases, particularly in the midterm elections, the Democrats do not get that much of the white vote. So they have to mobilize minorities, uh, particularly blacks. They have to get, let, make sure that Hispanics can vote. They have to mobilize the women's vote, and they have to uh, make sure that liberals don't vote for party candidates. And obviously in the Midwest, they have to make sure people can vote, which has been very problematic since these moderate governors have won. So here's kind of the storyline of what's been happening, which is that uh, the Democratic Party originally rose to settle sectional differences, which meant slavery by forming a coalition between the North and the South. So Southern Democrats used to be part of the Democratic coalition because Roosevelt organized around class issues and they didn't touch issues of slavery and, or racial politics in the New Deal uh, initially. Um, but once the Democratic Party began to embrace civil rights, in the 1950s and 60s, that coalition began to break apart 
and particularly after Reagan's election in 1980, the Democratic South became the Republican South. White Democratic South became the Republican South. And again, that's what led to this parity between the Electoral College and the Democrats and Republicans. The right wing in the United States was so fearful when Johnson won in 1964 because he was able to win a majority without the South. He didn't need the South to win the presidency. And there was fear <coughs> that the Democratic Party could have a permanent Democratic majority without that coalition from the South, which would suppress any attention to racial issues. And so after 1964, by the late 1960s, the right wing in the United States began to mobilize a counter movement to take back the country from liberalism. And initially they tried to do it by creating a third party. That wasn't successful. Reagan wasn't supportive of having a third party. So instead they set out to take over the Republican Party and they were successful. So in the Republican Party, essentially the right wing drove out all the Republican moderates. And again, now their base is white religious conservatives and right-wing populism, anti-intellectualism, trying to appeal to the white working class, particularly in the Midwest. The Democratic Party, since the 1960s, since they began to be more explicitly attentive to civil rights and therefore racial issues, has had a difficulty trying to keep together a coalition that deals with both racial issues and class issues. And particularly because they have been losing votes from the white working class, meaning in the Midwest. And unless the, the Democratic Party can bridge that gap between race and class, they can't mobilize their coalition and win elections. So, that's sort of what's been going on in the United States. And of course, immigrants are uh, a key here. Um, let me skip through this and just mention here that you can understand something about US politics through various politicians. Like Barack Obama was a phenomenon in part because in his own biography, he bridged race and class. Right. He's African American, but he didn't play up racial issues. Uh, he had both a white mother and a black father and so on, but that's an unusual sort of thing, and he had to very carefully address race issues. Uh, and then, of course, we had the biggest economic crisis in, since the 1930s, and that helped too. But because he has the possibility of bridging race and class, which would make it possible for the Democratic Party to win, that's why there's so much intense opposition to allowing him to govern. And that's why absolutely there's no compromise in terms of anything he's trying to do. It doesn't matter whether it's good for the country. The main issue is that he's not successful as a politician from the Republican side. Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton, when he won, essentially um, dealt with that tension in the Democratic Party between race and class by trying to opt out of that conversation to talk about themselves as new Democrats. They were going to have this bridge to the 21st century where they started talking about new class issues and the creation of, you know, sort of a new innovative world with professionals and technology and so on. Um, but in the 2008 election when Clinton, Hillary Clinton was competing with Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton did much better with white working class in the Midwest than Barack Obama did. He was able to win um, the uh, nomination and then the election uh, essentially because he mobilized caucus states whereas Clinton was able to win the states that actually had elections. So Clinton was doing much better by getting the vote of 
Barack Obama was able to get uh, delegates to the Electoral College because he mobilized through caucus states and some other technical details undermined the process of the superdelegates, which Clinton, Hillary Clinton had counted on. And then again, I mentioned Chris Christie. The reason that he's a phenomena is because they believe he can appeal to white working class men in the Midwest because of that kind of gruff, um, uh, rude exterior. Um, the Reagan Democrats would go for that. Okay, so I'm going to skip this part and um, maybe I'll go right to my conclusion and then uh, summarize the last point and then we can have discussion. So essentially what I argue is that the competition among categorical groups centers around access to jobs. Categorical groups meaning race, gender, citizenship, uh, etc. Especially jobs that are removed from the market and that pay a living wage. The use of advantage or social capital among these structurally advantaged and segregated groups uh, is the most important dynamic that reproduces long-term inequality. The use of advantage rather than discrimination or racism is what maintains the legitimacy of long-term inequality. And citizenship rights are extremely important determinant of who can gain access to legal wages and benefits. Blacks used to be the reserve labor force when they, prior to civil rights, once the civil rights movement came along that promised them, quote, citizenship rights, like legal wages and access to jobs, they could no longer serve as that reserve labor force. So essentially what happened, particularly for the black working class, is they have less access to jobs. Once people had to pay them legal wages and they could demand that, people stopped hiring them. And instead, we started importing more immigrants. So the Civil Rights Movement in the U.S. was passed in 1964. A new immigration law was passed in 1965 that made it easier for more immigrants to come into the U.S. who could then serve in that place of uh, low-wage jobs. So actually, there were two different kinds of immigrants. One was scientists and engineers who would get paid less than white scientists and engineers. And then there's the unskilled Mexican and other Central American immigrants who were taking unskilled service jobs. Um, and so the political dynamics around immigrants in the US are essentially to try to prevent them from getting citizenship rights. That they, people do, the right wing Republican Party does not want them to have the right to vote, and they don't want them to have rights to legal wages because then they wouldn't be the exploitable class anymore and keep wages down in those kinds of sectors. So what's happened is that as more and more immigrants have come into the United States and they have concentrated in certain areas like US, like uh, <coughs> Los Angeles and Chicago and uh, New York and has actually spread across more places in the country, they now have very large immigrant enclaves where they can begin to have normalized life situations. They can organize political organizations and they can begin to demand citizenship rights, like the Dreamers Act and the um, uh, new policies that Obama just announced in terms of who's been in the country for certain periods of time. So the dynamics of current immigrants are around trying to gain those kinds of citizenship rights and the politics of it is to make sure that they can't vote, because if they vote, they're likely to vote Democratic, and also that they can't gain legal wages. Um, so let me just um, end, and just one note is that I do include in my book and in the questions that I ask the interviewees a, uh, a question about um, that some research had shown that employers of low-wage workers would rather hire uh, Hispanic immigrants than U.S.-born blacks. And I asked the interviewees, why do you think that's the case? 
And almost overwhelmingly, they did not say it's because blacks won't work and because they're lazy. What they said was because immigrants don't know their rights and because they will work hard for no money. So I thought that was especially telling kind of uh, insight, even from the people that I interviewed in this study. So I think there's a lot of the same kinds of issues in Western Europe over immigration, is that you also have allowed immigrants into the country um, when there was either a labor shortage or growth periods where you needed a low-wage labor force, because even with globalization, there are certain jobs you can't export. And then once they're here, and they begin mobilizing for certain rights to uh, state benefits, um, then there becomes a different kind of politics and not welcoming, welcoming them as much as you otherwise would. So I'm going to stop there and uh, invite your questions. Okay, any questions, please? Yes. yes. I have two rather general questions, probably too general, but the first one is how the trends in social contact and social networking processes um, operate in the context of broader changes in the occupation structure. So you might expect, for instance, that social networking and social contacts would be more important in the private than the public sector, so the changing balance of public or private effects. Uh, you might expect that in the UK there's evidence that even in the category that's called professional and managerial, that social capital turns out to be less important in those where there are clear prudential, that prudentialism operates on a strict scale. Uh, and it's much more important in areas like marketing, PR, tourism, where certain kinds of social skills and characteristics are, are seen as important. And you can imagine that they can be very easy how they can be connected to race. Uh, and presumably the decline in the trade union movement in the UK excludes one form of, 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 of networking. So I just wonder how it operates in that context. And my second question then was, is your story about social network very depressing in public policy terms? Because if, if I understand properly, you know, in, 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 in the US, it's becoming more and more difficult to operate the sort of public policies which have typically have operated in terms of institutional discrimination because of the change in political configuration, the Supreme Court, and, and various things. But if it's, if it's becoming more difficult to do it in those sort of spheres, how would you do it in terms of social networking? How would you, you know, what, what could you do at a public policy level which would restrict the operation of advantage? Okay, so there are a lot of questions in there. Let me see if I can remember <laughs> my responses to them. First of all, in terms of the issues about um, growing areas of contact and uh, so on, there's been much less than we might have believed to be the case in the post-civil rights period. Um, in some of the talks I do, I've been drawing a lot on a recent book by uh, Kevin Stainback and Tom, Don Tomaskovic Devi called Documenting Desegregation, in which they had access uh, to the Equal Employment Opportunity Reports from uh, 1966 to 2005. So over that 50-year period since the Civil Rights Movement was passed, Basically what they found is that there was an initial somewhat uh, important but small desegregation between white men and black men and then nothing much happened with that after 1980. So there's been nothing changed in terms of the desegregation between white men and black men for 35 years. <coughs> There was a gradual change in desegregation between white men and white women uh, that ended about 2000, but it's still very slight. And uh, nothing had ever changed much between white men and black women. So even though there's been 50 years since the Civil Rights Movement, there not only has been not much change in terms of the desegregation of jobs, there has been, in fact, some resegregation, particularly between black women and white women. So that's one dynamic. 
Um, now, yes, there has been the growth of the black middle class that has been more important in the public sector than in the private sector. Uh, there's been a lot of attention to private companies to issues of diversity, but much less change than one would anticipate based on these data from EEOC. Um, now, the second issue that you asked, uh, did that address the first question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So the second issue is how depressed am I? <laughs> um, I I do find that um, that the the attacks on the wins from the civil rights movement and from uh, the progressive change that occurred in the 1960s is very depressing. Things that many people had sort of taken for granted as settled political issues are now being undone in dramatic ways because of the Supreme Court and because of the emergence of this very aggressive right-wing movement. Um, but the place where I think that uh, there is some hope, I guess, is that um, in the private sector, I think that there is a genuine interest in issues of diversity and of um, changing the dynamics in terms of uh, the opportunity structure within companies. But the, in, in that genuine interest, I don't think there's necessarily a depth of understanding about the issues. So let me give you an example that uh, sort of underlined this for me. I was invited uh, about two years ago to a small conference that was sponsored by a major Fortune 100 company that was very interested in issues of diversity. And the CEO of this company came to this small conference, which was only for about 30 academics. They wanted to influence business school faculty to do a better job of recruiting and graduating minority students so that they could hire them. And the CEO talked um, passionately about his commitment to diversity and about the importance of diversity, particularly in middle management, for their company because their entire growth was outside the US. Globalization was causing 75% of their profits. And as he said, People, he needed people in the company who could work with people whose names they couldn't pronounce. So he was really committed to these issues. And he himself, again, I was quite taken aback, <coughs> defined middle management in the company as too white, male, and stale. That's the words he used. And um, when I started mentioning things to him about implicit bias, for example, he knew all about that. He had hired Ma Mazarin Banaji from Harvard to come talk to top management in the company about these kinds of issues. So he's really knowledgeable and committed to this. But his entire framework was about bias against people. They had to get rid of bias against people rather than understanding how bias for people worked in the company, particularly among those middle managers who were white men. <clears throat> and that became clear to me that, that night at dinner, one of the HR directors said, oh, well, of course, we um, hire 50% or 60% of our people come from people who our current employees have recommended. So he was very committed to diversity, saw it as in absolutely important to the survival of his company, and yet the policies in the company were such that they hired people that their current middle managers recommended to them, even though he wanted to change the structure and composition of that middle management group. So I'm somewhat hopeful if we could get this message across that they would be more attentive to the kinds of policies they have that are reproducing the inequality that they say they'd like to mitigate. Yes. Thank you. Um, my questions are more um, methodological. Uh, first question is, what did your respondents know about your field of interest when you were talking to them? And secondly, I noticed that about halfway through, you started to refer to 
working class racists. Um, what criteria did you use to call a particular segment working class racists? In quotation marks, racist. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So um, that's a very important question, obviously, in terms of what I could or should tell the respondents about what I wanted to know because I wanted to know about how they tapped into racial advantage and reproduced racial inequality. Um, and I knew that I couldn't tell them that. But in the United States, there's what's called a human subjects review process, where you can't just go ask people questions without having the, the, your research proposals reviewed. So they insisted that in the um, not confidentiality agreement, but the consent, consent form that I at least included that I was going to talk about racial issues. So I included it in a set of other kinds of things. So when I sent letters to these people, I said that while I was writing a book about how people develop their educational and job histories, and I wanted to know how they got to where they were in their lives, but that I was going to ask them questions about inequality and fairness and public policy, including race, et cetera, et cetera. So I had to say that. Um, many of the people that I talked to um, were really very caught up in the interviews. They told me how much fun it was to talk about their lives and so on, so they didn't object. There were a few, particularly as I got to some of the um, value clarification questions and toward the end when I did some more exotic things where they were kind of getting a sense of it but for the most part there wasn't an objection and nobody uh, threw me out. There was one guy who almost did except he was at my house so that was, that's <laughs> um, he said I knew that this is what this was about and so I tried to say yeah but I'm trying to talk to many different kinds of people I want to be sure everybody's story is being told and that I have your views as well as others so then he was okay and he finished the interview um, the second question was about how I identify the working class races well again as I I didn't start out this study with knowing that I was going to hear these different political stories that wasn't part of what I was trying to do at all. I just wanted to know how whites tapped into advantages and how that uh, happened and who it came from and so on and how they thought about that in terms of understanding fairness and issues of inequality. Um, but early on I began to realize that these people sounded very different from each other. Again, when I went into uh, somebody's house and they told me that they were very religious and their church membership was the most important thing in their social identity um, I knew that I was going to hear from them that they were against the government and the government couldn't do anything right and you know those people in the inner city just are lazy etc etc versus when I went and I was quite surprised into a, a very exclusive neighborhood with a lot of really big houses and so on that I was going to hear people telling me about poverty and inequality and how important that was to them and, and so on. So those were the rich white liberals. Um, and then the working class racists were typically working class white men who were in, in union jobs where they were very liberal on union issues but explicitly anti-black and were the only ones who would say those kinds of things to me. So that's why I called them working class racist and put it in quotation marks. But the explanation that I give in the book, and I do think this is the case, is that these are the interviewees who are in jobs that pay a middle class lifestyle without middle class credentials because they don't have the education and so if they didn't get those kinds of jobs and had to go into the job market, they have no credentials to bring with them. So to them, this was a critical issue, and they perceived the civil rights movement as directly challenging their access and those of their kids to jobs like that. Whereas the rich white liberals, and I got that terminology because one of the people I interviewed told me that. He said, I'm a rich white liberal, the easy kind. And I thought that was very perceptive as well, because it, that's 
more or less how I interpreted it. He was in a job that even if affirmative action was aggressively enforced or followed, it wasn't going to affect him or his job. Because for the most part, blacks didn't live in his neighborhood, they didn't have a similar education, and they weren't prepared for the kinds of jobs that he held. So they were, as I said, could afford to be generous. And I, they were I the ones with liberal politics. I found right. the same in my research knowledge. Uh -huh. so, so I spent about six months reading through my interviews and taking notes on what people said to try to come up with a criteria for defining who was in which group. So I started with religious conservatives because those were easy. Anyone who told me that they were born again Christians and that that was very important to them, I put in the religious conservative category. The rich white liberals were reasonably easy to identify. And then again, the working class racist in quotation marks were the ones that told me that they didn't like blacks coming around their neighborhood and these people were lazy, etc. So they were explicitly anti black. And then the apolitical majority were, they didn't know anything about politics, they didn't care about it. One person said, well, I don't even know if I voted. Uh, I really don't pay much attention to that sort of thing. So, you know, I had certain kinds of things I looked for in the interviews, and then I put them into these categories. Yes, thank you. Yes? Um, just, um, you know, just to read up, I was reading your book as well, so I'm in a lot of the things you talk about, you talk about, you know, and um, how, and of why it's because it, it I'm doing almost the same kind of research, but this time I'm comparing um, migrants' experiences. So they're telling me their employment experience, and a lot of those findings are there, um, the hoarding of um, resources. But one thing I didn't hear in all of this is about superiority and inferiority. And I think in race critical theory, critical race theory, a lot of the things they would talk about would be about um, the hierarchy. And, and so I didn't hear, I didn't see a lot of that, and I didn't hear that. You know, and I, I, I get, so for me, it makes it easier to explain it to people and people can receive it and you can hear it better, you know, than when you, you know, put it in people's face that, you know, the reason we're not employing this set of people or we're keeping them in this kind of jobs is because of, um, you know, I think my race is superior to this. But I think when you talk to a lot of uh, people of black descent, that for them is what their experience from the other side. So I don't know. Um, if in talking to only whites, if the um, a lot of um, writers talk about um, the um, lack of awareness of white privilege, so I don't know if that impacted on your work in not being able to, in not um, um, framing it, you know, around um, um, superiority and, and that. Okay, let me respond to that in several different ways. First of all, when I first started this project, I was going to talk to everybody because I thought I should. But then I realized when I actually started being explicit about the methodology that I really couldn't. If I wanted to talk to working class and middle class men and women, and I was just going to go to the East Coast and the Midwest, but the Russell Sage Foundation that gave me the money said that I had to also go to the South. So that already is 12 cells. And uh, you know, men, women, working class, middle class, in three different locations. And I felt that I had to do at least 25 interviews in each of those cells in order to have some kind of meaningful findings for white working class men in Ohio versus white working class men in New Jersey, etc. And so if I had added blacks to that, it would have doubled it, right? Instead of doing 250 interviews, I would have had to do 500 and so on. So I realized I just couldn't do that. Um, but in the interviews, I was trying to follow some of, not critical race theory, but I was trying to follow some of the cultural sociology stuff to look at boundaries and boundary setting. So I tried to ask people about, you know, who they thought of as better than them and who they thought of as worse off than them and so on. And I just couldn't get any meaningful responses on that. So for example, um, one of the people I interviewed, I said, well, tell me about the neighborhood where you grew up. You know, uh, was there any ethnic diversity? And he said, oh, no, there was no ethnic diversity, just normal people like me. You know, so he, he just 
thought, you know, whites were the norm and that, you know, ethnic meant not him. Um, uh, I tried to ask people about what kind of groups would you say that you belong to and they couldn't, they didn't think about race and class and so on. They said I'm nice and I'm honest and so on. So I tried to get that kind of boundary defining stuff and it just, it, it was so not salient in people's thinking about themselves. They simply thought about themselves as normal, average people and never thought about issues of race, so I didn't get that. Now, I did have an um, African-American student who um, did some interviews with blacks. In fact, in my sample, there were some um, errors when we would interview people on the phone about whether they were U.S.-born whites between the ages of 25 and 55, so I actually did interview two black people in my study because they didn't know that they weren't supposed to be interviewed. So I went ahead and interviewed them. And then I had my student do another 15 or so interviews with the idea that maybe at some point we would do a black study to parallel my white study. And um, I never was able to do that. I just, it took too long to do this book, <coughs> let alone to do that book. But she went ahead and did her own book on blacks. Um, very different than the one I did, but she did her own book on blacks. And one of the things she found was that blacks who ended up in middle class jobs basically got there through social programs, like through affirmative action or through some kind of jobs program and so on, because they couldn't get that kind of help from their families. But um, she didn't really pursue the same kind of theory that I did. So, other questions? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you um, whether you had in your research seen anything that was beyond individuals, so looking at maybe um, larger groups. And the reason I ask that question is I'm thinking that when you are, when certain types of um, groups of people try to um, make the, the market more friendly for other ethnic groups that are applying for jobs. A lot of times in the U.S. it will be set up somewhat like what they do at the law school level, which is that they'll have a large jobs fair or something like that, and the universities are supposed to go through that process to do the hiring. And so at the law school level, when that process started in the United States, um, because it was set up specifically to get more um, ethnic candidates into law faculties, then there was a major drop off of the number of law schools that were participating in that formal sort of, um, you know, interview, determine who you're going to interview, do the formal interviews, then invite them back to campuses. They dropped out from that process. So a, lot, a lot of the major universities don't even go to this. Um, and so then once again, you're back in the same situation where um, ethnic minorities have problems getting access to these jobs because again, they're being offered in an informal way um, and they're not being advertised openly through that other process. So I was just wondering if maybe in your research... Again, you I looked at individual people from randomly selected households, not employers giving people jobs. So I'm not going to see that, but uh, that particular dynamic, but the data show, again, that once blacks in the post-civil rights period could claim legal wages and access to these kinds of jobs, companies stopped hiring. So that there was an increase in black unemployment, uh, particularly for those with no more than a high school degree after that point, because companies didn't want to hire them. And I heard from all the people I interviewed about how companies couldn't fire blacks because they would cry discrimination, they would say. But, uh, and of course, I didn't see that directly because I wasn't talking to employers. So, um, again, if you look at Kevin Stainback and Don Thomas Govick Devey's book on desegregation, again, you'll see that things were really pretty steady state. Essentially, white men increased their representation in the best jobs after the civil rights movement instead of really being at risk in some way. Yeah. Yes? I wondered. Um how, um, in the methodology, how, how you would try to figure out if people were white or black during the sampling? We asked right? them. We asked them. And then how did these errors occur? 
uh, people either weren't listening or my <laughs> student forgot to mention that part. Okay. You know, so we did it by zip codes. So we went to zip codes that were disproportionately white or disproportionately managerial or whatever, but either the person didn't hear when he said, you know, we're looking to interview Caucasians, whatever. So they just said, oh, yeah, sure, I want to They were phrasing it as Caucasians rather than white? Okay. I don't remember what she said. Uh, my student did like all the phone would, calling. How you would, like, try to bring this to the respondent? Yeah, people don't necessarily listen on the phone, but, but it also can be that my student was so interested in getting these interviews set up that she, maybe she forgot to ask if they were white. So anyhow, two people I interviewed weren't white when I showed up at the door. I was surprised. But they had very interesting stories, right? Um, one was working class, one was middle class. But, and so I wanted to pursue that, but I didn't do I didn't have a chance to do it myself. Americans like to participate. Yeah. <laughs> people seem to were like lonely. to do these interviews. That was very interesting. You know, one of the things I found, by the way, that really surprised me is among the working class men, I interviewed 246 people. It was going to be 250, but a couple people canceled at the last minute, and I just didn't have the energy to set up more interviews to substitute. Um, probably about a dozen to 15 maybe 15, maybe a dozen to a dozen and a half of the white men couldn't read, which I was really surprised at. And <coughs> part of the, uh, the, the study involved um, these semi-structured interviews where I asked them about their life history and their educational history and family history and their job history, and then I shifted into a lot of stuff about public policy issues. Then I also asked them about some value clarification questions and some scenarios and which of these things do you find most likely. Uh, and then I had this little survey. So part of the study included having to read these questions and there were a number of people I interviewed where I realized as I was getting through it that I had to read it to them because they, they weren't capable of reading. Um, but these were people in union jobs where they got in because somebody helped them and. Um, this one guy said that, you know, he he had to take a test to get into this company, but he didn't know how to read, so his friend gave him a copy of the test with the answers, and he knew enough just to answer enough to make it possible to get the job, which happened to be in a black city where white blacks couldn't get those jobs, but he did. Um, yes. Um. I was wondering, um, this, it sounds uh, similar to the gender um, um, dynamics of getting more women into top positions or higher positions. Um, do you think it is similar? And do you, I was also wondering if, because we're talking about whites in an, in an advantaged position and then reproducing this advantage among whites, if um, any um, race person, any race, comes into an advantaged position in a, in a job, would he um, reproduce the same advantage in to sim similar people to him or her? Yes. Well, yeah, I get that question a lot where people said that everybody helps their own, what, you know, blacks do the same thing, Hispanics do the same thing, and so on. And yes, that is true. But whites are disproportionately in the best jobs with the highest income, with the most training, with the best opportunities, with job ladders that go somewhere. So it makes a difference if whites are helping other whites. It's not just the same as blacks helping other blacks because they're not in the same kinds of jobs. But there also is a, a dynamic that happens. I mean, if there is a black or a woman or someone who does get into those kinds of jobs, they're sometimes very sensitive about hiring too many people like them mm -hmm. because they think it will look badly for them. So sometimes they're conscious of not doing that. Although I think in general that there's more likely that they will say that a woman will hire another woman as opposed to a man hiring another woman. I think there's some evidence for that, but they don't hire only women. They will hire, just be more likely to do so. By the way, for a criminologist in the uh, crowd here. I also talked to a number of people who engaged in legal act, illegal activity but then didn't get arrested because someone gave them a break and looked the other way. 
So there was some of that too, where it seemed to me they wouldn't have been treated that way if they were black. That's good. Yes. In, by the way. Yes. <laughs> One of the things that struck me also is the um, the disparate levels of engagement that different ethnic groups have with the criminal justice system, and particularly, you know, the, the the impact of informal measures in terms of stop and search, and you know, the impact that has on quality of life issues on a day-to-day -day basis, but also then the more structural impacts of either a, a criminal record, a felony conviction, or a, a prison a conviction. And particularly <coughs> the, the concentrated impact it has in particular areas, given that you'll have, uh, uh, I mean, even, even in Ireland, the prison population is derived by and large from a relatively small number of, of coastal areas. Um, and um, those prisoners then, upon release, return to those areas. and in terms of advantage, they will be of little use to yeah, others yeah. or to themselves in terms of securing employment or pressing home some kind of advantage in the, the job market. So just the, the concentration effects again. Yeah, again, one of the things that struck me was that um, in the interviews, it did seem that for whites, there was a floor to downward mobility because some of the people that screwed up one way or the other, they got involved in drugs or they were uh, engaged in some kind of minor illegal activities or whatever, is someone would pull them out by about their mid-20s. When they, their family members thought they need to get things moving in terms of family formation and so on, somebody would help them at that point. So for example, there was uh, one guy that I talked to that I don't know, he entered college and he got hurt his freshman year, he did something and then he said he got into a little bit of difficulty, he was hanging around with people he didn't, he shouldn't have been hanging around with, he lost his license and so on, and his driving license, and so he moved to another state and was working in this other state, but by the time he was in his mid-twenties and he was ready to get married, his uncle, who worked for the New York Stock Exchange, said, come back home, I can get you in there. And so this guy came back after having screwed up, uh, as he described it himself, and was able to get a job that paid about 75000 working on the New York Stock Exchange. Not as a stockbroker, but as a technician or something. And was living a nice middle-class lifestyle in the same neighborhood where his family grew up. Uh, there was another one who said that uh, he wanted to go to college, but the teacher told him that he probably wasn't college material, and then he tried to go to college, but he couldn't pass the Spanish exam or something like that. <clears throat> and then he worked in a factory, and it was really hard work. It was a foundry or something, and he found it really aversive, and he was trying to figure out what to do, and he said, I was making a little money, and I was spending it, and so on. And then his wife's family all of whom worked at the U.S. Post Office. So his wife worked there, and her father worked there, and her brother worked there, said, why don't you try for a job at the Post Office? And he said, I did really well on the civil service exam, which you have to take to get a government job. <coughs> but of course, if his wife, his, her father, and his brother, her brother were all at the Post Office, they could tell him what was on the civil service exam, right, and what to expect. So then he got a job at the post office and then was able to have a middle class lifestyle. So that kind of thing happened. And uh, there's another fellow that I talked to that uh, he could have gone to college, his parents would have paid for it, but he got involved in drugs and music after high school and he was doing sound stuff for bands and playing in bars and um, again getting involved in drugs and he sort of said that you know, this was, uh, uh, you know, an unfortunate thing that was happening and so on, but then again, somebody could, I, I don't remember the details, but somebody liked him and got him a job in a particular place and he ended up in a major company and then, uh, so it was still a working class job and he was going to school on the side and so on, but again, somebody came along by his mid-twenties and helped him into a job. So. That seemed to be happening. I, I ran into very few people who were desperately poor and stayed that way. I mean, they, they, I, I talked to a number of poor people, 
but most of them had somebody through the family that could sort of help them get into a job with relatively stable income. Not everybody, but most of them. Other questions? Oh, no, go ahead. Um, you, you mentioned that you have, uh, one day uh, you would be able to get the message across to the CEO that um, it's about structural inequality rather than yeah, from, bias right? for as opposed to bias against. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then you also mentioned that when you were teaching people sociology and you, you got blank faces. Um, yeah, in the business in, school. In the business yeah. school, like yeah. how to, and I didn't how have to that get the message. Yeah, yeah, like how to, to like make sure. Yeah get this message across um, about the racial inequality, like the structures of it. And I think here we can also draw a parallel with um, gender inequality. Like for example, if you talk about rapists versus general structures and these kind of things, like the, the emphasis on um, racism or the emphasis on sexual violence versus it's a, it's a more structural thing and we shouldn't, it shouldn't be invisible. Yeah. I mean, I do think that the story I'm telling is applicable to a number of different kinds of categorical groups. So I, you know, men help other men more than they help women, and whites help whites more than they help non-whites. Um, I'm sure Hispanics help Hispanics, and so on. Uh, so I do think that the general dynamic is applicable across groups, but the historical specificity of it is quite different. And, um, and again, I don't think that I, I, I don't think that it's just parallel. So there is some research that shows that blacks don't help other blacks in the same way, in part because if they're in, they themselves feel vulnerable in their jobs, then they are not as likely to recommend a friend who might not do a good job and then would make them look bad. So there's been some research to suggest that. And I do think that women to some extent have some of the same issues, is that women have carry the same prototypes of who's competent as do men. And um, so they're not necessarily going to give preference to women. But disproportionately, they maybe will do so compared to men. But they're not going to do it on a regular basis. In my work on scientists and engineers, I didn't find that women managers were more likely to do well with women employees. So, no, I don't think it's universal. Now, did you ask me something else and I forgot? Yeah, mainly like how we... Um, how, how you change things? Yeah, I change things. <laughs> um, and again, I've done a lot of media stuff uh, around the book. Uh, fortunately, the Russell Sage Foundation hired a public relations firm that uh, promoted my book along with others. And um, it was kind of an interesting dynamic because my book is mostly about how whites get jobs. The media people that wanted to talk to me wanted to talk to me almost entirely about why blacks don't get jobs. So even though I was trying to do this story about bias for, everybody wanted to talk about bias against. And in some cases, even when I gave my explicit story, they would turn it into a new form of racism. And they would say, see, this shows that there's all this racism out there, even though my whole story was about how whites don't have to be racist to benefit from racial inequality. So it's not an easy story to tell, but I do think that uh, it's an important one. And many of the people that I did talk to in the media um, even though it's such a simple story, whites help other whites, it's through advantage, not discrimination, uh, people would say, oh, I never thought of that before. That's a new way of looking at things, right? So I do think it's important to try to get the message out there, uh, but it's, it's not necessarily easy. Jerry, did you? Yeah, if everybody else is finished. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Oh, go, go, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. And I um, think it's incredible work. You're Thank unpacking you. the knapsack of white privilege and yeah. you're making that visible and transparent. And you're exploring those um, intricate networks, the minutiae, which leads to certain people being privileged and advantaged. But I'm just wondering um, what role can the state or the government play in terms of how it commissions, 
of pr procurement based interventions and how they change the demographic profile of those organisations who only recruit particular types of people. Yeah, that, that also is a variation of a question that I get a lot, so what do you do about it? <laughs> right. And um, I talk about it very briefly at the end of the book. I probably didn't give as much attention to that issue as I should have. Um, but my standard answer is that um, it's not necessarily an individual solution. It's not what we as individuals do, although individual people being attentive to these kinds of things can be conscious of the kinds of decisions that they're making and choose to act differently. But it's, first of all, a social movement, collective policy story. Affirmative action worked, and we probably should support that, even though there's eroding support for it in the United States. Um, at a company level, companies can be attentive to the kinds of policies that they are uh, enacting. Like a company that gives people rewards for recommending their friends to a job, if they pay attention to that uh, because they are concerned about diversity, they may not keep doing that. They may uh, enact policies that have been recommended in terms of all the stuff on implicit bias that uh, <coughs> lay out the criteria in advance instead of allow people to make subjective <coughs> decisions about who's competent and so on. Um, so there are things that companies can do, and individuals can also make, you know, yes. uh, be conscious again of the kinds of choices that they're making. Because frequently we just don't think about these things. Of course, we help our friends, right? Um, so you know, I've used this example. I have two children. Of course, I'm not going to deny help to my children. But if I have a mo the moral dilemma about racial inequality in the U.S., I will support public policies that help other people's children, too. So that's kind of my answer. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I was interested in was the role of class, particularly. So there's lots of, the majority of people in the United States who are poor are actually white. And they tend to live in, in the the area yes. that you're come right. from, yes. the, the uh, Appalachia. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, so I was wondering how the respondents explained away the economic inequality that of course has gotten much worse in the U.S. And I was wondering if they're class, if they're class blind as well as col col color blind, because if they don't see the structures of, of inequality in terms of class, it's highly unlikely they're going to see the structures of, of, of inequality in terms of race. So the individualism that you found might explain away both. But I think that's a, a, another dimension, because obviously in the poor or white areas, the white people are going to help each other get jobs. But there's still going to be high, high rates of unemployment and a lot of bad bad jobs. So that, that would seem to add, add another dimension to what you're talking about. And secondly, when it came to my in immigration post-1965, the vast majority of immigrants have been family in, in, in immigrants. Legal immigrants. Yeah, the vast legal. majority of legal immigrants, well, but, but, but there's a whole bunch but, of illegal right, but, immigrants. But, the vast, but yeah. the vast majority of immigrants have been legal. And they've been, yeah, well, it's yeah. according to the okay. figures. Yeah. And they have been unskilled. So, But, but the, US, the U.S. policy is the only major developed country in the world that allows a large portion of unskilled in, in, immigrants into the country. Right? And, and there haven't been problems with those. And so when, when you're talking about it in, in immigration, you seem to express it solely as a transfer from using blacks as a, as a labor reserve to illegal in, in immigrants, which is a little bit more complex than that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and also the, the immigration, of course, that we've had post-65 has made the United States add more diverse than it's ever been in terms of race, race and ethnicity. Probably sent, if you include race. Yes, right. Okay, right. so it's more complex again. When so you, I thought the the immigration material at the end was sort of an add-on. Well, it was sort of an add-on, but also I skipped about three or four ah. of the slides that got okay. through the <laughs> the, okay. the storyline. Um, so the first thing about class yeah, issues and, and recognition of the class. First of all, the 
the reality is it took me so long to do this book that I did the interviews during an economic boom. Okay. Um, so people at that point said there are so many jobs, anybody could have a job that wants one, etc. But I was very surprised. Um, Maybe I wasn't as attentive to it as I should be, but when people talked about policy issues, government issues, or economic concerns that they had, they did not talk about globalization, and about employers restructuring or firing them, and so on and so forth. For the most part, they talked about those people taking my jobs. So it, it was so striking again, that they had such an individual view of the world, that they could do anything, they tried anything, that they did not think in structural terms. The only people who thought in structural terms were the rich white liberals, right, who then talked about poverty and unemployment and the difficulties for some people getting jobs and so on and so forth. Um, there were a few exceptions among the white working class racists that I talked to. One of them was um, extremely perceptive, and he was explicitly racist um, in terms of things he said. But he also talked about, um, I don't know if I can reproduce the, the way he said it, but he talked about how uh, things were going really well in the 1970s, and a working man was making a really good wage, and they could go out and play golf and do all this stuff. And then he says, and then the uh, employers didn't like that, that they were uh, doing so well. So they started uh, I don't know, closing factories or whatever. And he said, you know, when you have um, uh, a million jobs and 500,000 people, anybody can get a job and the wages will go up. But when you have a million, job, a million jobs and two million people, the wages will go down and so on. He was one of the few that uh, talked about those kinds of issues, and he was very articulate about it. But he, he was also very pro-union and involved in his unionized jobs, and also very explicitly black, uh, anti-black. Uh, but he talked about, and, and again, I, some of his uh, quotes I had to catch myself not to overuse some of his stuff, because um, he, he talked about, um, he said, I didn't have, I, education was never that important to me. Um, I didn't really had to focus on education because I knew half the people in the county. His brother was the quarterback of the local football team, so he knew lots of people. Uh, and then he also told me about how his daughter, you know, got a job because he knew the union committeemen, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, so he's talking about these people taking our jobs. And I'm trying to remember the way he said it. Something about um, if you have, uh, I, I can't remember it, but the idea was that um, if, you, if you have 40 jobs and you have uh, a certain number of white people and, you know, they should be able to get these jobs and so on. But, but the way he said it was an over-representation of what jobs white should get. But I can't remember the details. It was really a great story. But one of the things that um, I was puzzling over that I, asked, I was asked about and I was sort of more speculating than actually knowing was what was the difference between those working class racists, who was the majority of the working class people that I talked to who weren't religious conservatives or apolitical people, um, and the working class liberals who were more concerned about poor people and, and so on. And it seemed to me when I, I started writing uh, the paragraphs that said what kinds of jobs these people in were in, that the working class racists were the ones that were in unionized jobs who were trying to get their kids into those kinds of jobs and were very angry because they thought government policy was keeping them from helping their kids get these jobs. The working class liberals were in jobs like uh, construction and so on 
where they were trying to make sure their kids got an education so that they didn't have to take the kinds of jobs they had. And so that seemed to have a very different view in terms of how they looked at what needed to be done. Um, then did you, you asked me about my, my slippery, sloppy mm -hmm. way of talking about immigration. Um, you're right about that. It's much more complicated. Um, but I do think, I mean, because I've done this work on scientists and engineers, um, so I'm very conscious of some of the dynamics there that white working, white men stopped going into science and engineering and started getting business degrees. And so the number of whites in engineering programs started leveling off about the 1970s while these companies were growing. But um, companies that hire engineers often do so with government contracts, and so they tend to be boom and bust. So it's not necessarily a very good job for a highly educated workforce. And they began recruiting Asian immigrants, essentially, into those kinds of jobs to replace the whites who were no longer going into those, instead going into finance. Um, but that's a different level of immigration than the unskilled immigration. So we have two tracks. In both cases, the wages in those types of jobs were either kept down or didn't rise as quickly because immigrants were available <coughs> to take those jobs and native-born Americans um, uh, would have demanded more money. So I don't know if that yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, I mean, basically, the argument seems to be that we should think about like racial inequality as um, stemming from bias for rather than bias against. Yes. Um, whereas bias against seems to be like of secondary importance, in a way. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's another place where I some somewhat <coughs> sloppy in my articulation of that. In that, because I'm trying to get across the issue about advantage as opposed to discrimination. It sometimes sounds like I'm saying there is no discrimination and there's no racism. Well, of course there is. And these white working class racists are, you know, are a prime example where they feel threatened, where they think that the privileges <coughs> will be undermined. They do then fight back and express these negative hostile feelings. Yes, obviously, yeah. I mean, I've identified that some people are explicitly racist. But like what you said before as well, that most people in their accounts, they, they seem to be real nice people and they don't right. engage, like at least not explicitly, right. in like right. uh, discriminatory attitudes. And I mean, it's quite an obvious question, and maybe it would be stupid for asking it as well, but how did you tackle the problem of like social desirable answers in this? About so, what? Like sort of like socially desirable answers, so that people give answers because they know what certain social norm requires of them, as you mentioned yourself, like there's sort of like this uh, American creed that says we're all pro equality and we're all pro, uh, you know, maybe individualism or liberty, etc. So most people would not, probably not, explicitly engage in such um, I don't know, discriminatory comments. And then, I think, yeah. So how did you tackle that problem, of, or like how did you consider it? Yeah. No, I I gave a great deal of thought to that and wasn't sure whether I could get at these kinds of issues. But one of the things I did um, was tried not to ask people explicitly about things that I thought would trigger socially desirable responses. So I didn't ask them, what do you think about affirmative action? What I asked them was, what do you think about the changes that have occurred in the last 20 years in terms of the access to education and jobs for women? What do you think about for black, for African Americans, for immigrants, etc.? Now that was really about affirmative action, but that's not what I asked them. And this, the responses I got, I thought were genuine responses about issues of affirmative action, but I didn't have to use that term. And similarly, I didn't ask them about what do you think about taxes. What I said was, um, uh, do you think that people, I, first of all I said what kind of groups do you think you are in, people like you. And then do you think people like you get what you deserve from the government? And then I ask them, and um, do you think that if some people didn't make so many demands on the government that people like you would get more or something? Would, would you, people like you be better off? 
So I changed the kinds of questions to get at uh, taxes, welfare, um, affirmative action, immigration, and so on without explicitly asking those kinds of questions. And I think I got very meaningful responses to those. And also surprising ones. For example, you know, you hear so much in the U.S. news, if you pay any attention to it, about how everybody's against taxes, etc. When I ask people that question about, do you think if some people didn't make so many demands on the government, would people like you be better off? Overwhelmingly, people said, no, it wouldn't make any difference to me. They'd just spend the money on something else. You know, so I didn't hear a strong anti-tax story at all. And when I asked people about the government, which was surprising to me, it was amazing that people did not have a conception of what government actually does. Uh, I heard so many people say, uh, I don't want anything from the government, I don't get anything from the government, I don't deserve anything from the government, and I don't think other people should either. And, um, and to them, they, they entirely reduced government to welfare payments or unemployment insurance. They never thought about schools and roads and parks and water systems and police and so on as government. And so everybody who then talked about the government assumed that um, they should keep all the current social services that they have, and the government should give them medical insurance, and the government should pay for the local schools, but they shouldn't have to pay more taxes because there was a lot of government waste that could take care of all those things. So that was, you know, yeah. Because I was just wondering, but I mean, this argument uh, um, reminds me a lot of like some uh, theories in social psychology, where they basically make the same argument or like, um, like debate about the same dilemma, where we can like see that sort of like bias for rather than bias against only the. Well, I'm drawing from some of that. Yeah. Yeah, or that, but they, they just would uh, conceptualize as like uh, what's the role of like outgroup discrimination versus like in-group favoritism. And I wondered like whether you considered this literature or like outgroup hate versus in-group love, is something to call it. Yeah, uh, I've actually written about some of that in my science and engineering work and also in uh, this other article that I did in the annual review of sociology, is that, um, so this isn't coming so much from my interview study in the book, but I think it's consistent, which is that um, we do have, it, it is not the case that every out group favors people like them and they're always against I mean, every in-group favors people like them and they're against the out-group. Uh, some out-groups, quote and unquote, favor the in-group uh, through what's called system justification theory, right? Is they think they're better than I am and that's the way it should be. So there is some of that kind of dynamic. And it's also the case that both out-groups and in-groups from status construction theory and through some other kinds of psychological theories show that there are these prototypes of the normative in-group that everybody buys into. So in my science and engineering study, for example, it is not the case that white managers evaluated white employees better than non-white employees. Everybody evaluated white, white employees better because there is this prototype of who's competent and white men fit into both competent and nice. To talk about Susan Fisk's work, if you're into psychology. So, you know, it's a little like more complicated than just in-group, out-group. And so I've been trying to uh, write for a while and get the message across that social identity theory has been so um, naively presented, particularly in the management literature, as in-group, out-group being the only dynamic, whereas Susan Fisk's work, which I think is brilliant, you know, talks about it's mostly um, the in-group, which is thought of as both competent and nice, or warm and competent. And then there is multiple out-groups, not just one, because having multiple out-groups contributes to the legitimacy of the system. And it, of the multiple outgroups, most of the stereotypes are ambiguous or mixed. 
So she talks about benevolent sexism and benevolent racism and so on, where women are thought of as nice but not competent, and immigrants are thought of as competent but not nice, and so on. And that it's that mix of stereotypes that allows people to think they're being fair and not see the, the uh, strong fault line between us and them. I will withhold my question <laughs> in the interest of time. Um, but I think we'd like to thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And it only took 20 years. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs>